Hi, thank you, Peter. And just to clarify the donations for my Nicaragua trip are not to pay for my trip, you understand, it's to take uh, items down there and leave them down there as gifts uh, for the folks down there. So I appreciate any help you can give in that regard. Now, but before that, let's get into God's Word for a little bit. How's that sound? Why don't you take your Bible and turn to Matthew chapter 8. <laughs> And beginning at verse 23, let me just read for you a couple of verses. Matthew chapter 8, verse 23. And it says this, And when he, that's Jesus, got into the boat, his disciples followed him. Verse 24, And behold, there arose a great storm. I read a book once. Uh, I mean, I've read more than one book, but... I, I read this book called the, the Road Less Traveled by Scott Peck. It was a bestseller at its time. And I still remember his opening sentence in the first chapter of the book. He said this, life is difficult. That's true. Life is difficult. Because storms happen. Everybody experiences storms adversarial conditions, tough circumstances, tragic events. Everybody experiences life storms. Some people are in a storm right now. Some of you are just coming out of a storm. Some of you are about to go into one. Just don't know it yet. And if you have never experienced a storm in your life, Storms are like the rain in Ireland. Over there they say, if it's not raining, just wait a couple of minutes and it'll start. So if you have never had a storm come into your life, just wait. And there's all kinds of storms. Relational storms, marital storms, money storms, health scare storms, work-related storms, e emotional storms, depression, sadness, worry, stress, loss, awful storms, mental storms, storms of regret, storms of insecurity, failure, guilt, storms of self-doubt. And when a storm hits, you want to take shelter and that's what we're talking about today, finding shelter in the storm. There's a little outline in your program. You can pull it out and follow along. We started this little message last week on finding shelter in the storm. And so this is part two, and we'll finish this off today. So let's read the story again, and we'll do a wee recap. Verse 23, when he got into the boat, his disciples followed him. Verse 24. And behold, there arose a great storm on the sea, so that the boat was being swamped by the waves. First thing we established last week about storms was that storms happen. Storms are sown into the fabric of life. Jesus said, in this life you will have trouble, storms. That's the reality of storms. Storms are very much like the fabric, uh, part of the fabric of life is taxes. You'll never escape taxes and you'll just not avoid storms. Job said exactly the same thing as the sparks of a fire fly upwards, so was a man born for trouble. Storms. We noticed last week in the story some things about storms. Because storms don't operate like a bus on a bus schedule. They're, they're not predictable. They're, you can't plan storms. You, you don't know when the next storm is going to happen. What, when it's coming or what kind of storm it's going to be. Storms come, and I jotted down a couple of observations about storms in your notes there. Storms come when you're doing a good thing. Look at verse 23. When he got into the boat, his disciples followed him. In other words, they're doing a good thing. They're following Jesus. They're being obedient. It doesn't get any better than that. They're being good people. And yet, 
They end up in the middle of a storm. I remember a friend of mine got a speeding ticket on his way to church one Sunday morning, and he was on the soundboard that morning, and he needed to get there early, and he was running late, and so he was speeding a little bit, and he said to me when he got to church, here I was coming to church to do something good, and I get penalized for it. The moral of that story is don't speed on your way to church. When a storm comes into your life, it doesn't mean that you're doing something wrong. And it certainly doesn't necessarily mean that you're a bad person. Storms come sometimes when you're doing a really good thing. Or maybe when you're speeding. Also, storms are unpredictable. Look what the text says. There arose a great storm. Life storms are often like that. They just come up out of the blue, often at the worst possible time. I mean, when do you get a flat tire? Just when you're rushing out the door to go for an interview for that job that you've been after for a long time. Storms come at the most inconvenient, unpredictable times. Storms also come in all shapes and sizes. Look what kind of storm this was. It says, it was a great storm. Greek word there is seismos, from which we get the word seismic or earthquake. It's like the Teutonic plates under the sea have moved and have caused massive waves. Some life storms are like that, like the Teutonic plates of your life have shifted. Big storms. Storms, of course, also cause a lot of damage. Their storm here is causing a lot of damage. The boat is being swamped. It's full of water, and it's almost going under. And life storms are like that sometimes. They can cause a lot of damage. Storms can really upset your plans and your dreams and your ambitions. I was sitting up in our front porch one Saturday morning a few years ago and a storm blew in. Lightning hit a tree a couple of doors down from our house and it, the tree fell onto the power lines and snapped the wooden hydro pole like a matchstick and the weight of the first pole strained the pole on either side of the tree and of course they snapped. And then the weight of those poles strain the next two wooden hydro poles and they snapped and I, I watched the hydro poles snap right in front of our house and it domino affected the lines and the poles all the way up and down Cothra until 30 wooden hydro poles had snapped and were lying side on right on Cothra all the way up and down the road. <coughs> was the most bizarre scene I've ever seen. One pole actually went right through a car hood on the road right in front of our driveway. The driver wasn't able to get out of his car until the hydro people came along and cut off the power to the lines. Life storms can cause a lot of damage just like that. And then there's one more observation about storms. Storms make you scared. Look at verse 25. Save us, Lord, because we're perishing. These guys think they're going to die. Those hydro wires lying across the road made our street look like downtown Beirut. I remember our kids wouldn't let me walk to the end of the driveway. They were yelling at me, screaming at me, getting mad at me because I was venturing too close to the sidewalk. Because storms are scary. They can make you fear the worst. So we talked about all of that last week. We also discovered last week that storms confuse. Look at verse 24. Behold, there arose a great storm on the sea, so that the boat was being swamped by the waves, but he, that's Jesus, was asleep. They're going to drown in a minute. Jesus is sleeping. Matthew, Mark 4, 38, same story says this, but he was in the stern asleep on a cushion and they woke him and they said to him, teacher, do you not care? There's the confusion. <coughs> Don't you care that we're going to die? You no, know, a lot of people follow the Lord all of their life, go to church all their life, 
serve the Lord, faithful to the Lord. And then, a, and then a storm plows in. And they, they're left thinking, why? God, don't you care? Storms can cause a lot of confusion about God. And causes a person to wonder, why does God seem to operate on a different plane than me? God, I just don't understand why you're operating the way you're operating and it almost seems like you're asleep at the switch. Storms do that. They, they cause confusion. And then verse 25, they went and they woke him saying, Save us, Lord, for we are perishing, we are dying. That's a cry of desperation. Here's a third thing about storms. Storms make you desperate. This is where people plead and bargain with God. I know this because I've done this. God, I'll do anything for you if you'll just save me here. I'll become a missionary if you save me. I used to think that's how people became missionaries. <laughs> Desperation prayer. I've heard so many people say, Lord, I'll, I'll go to any part of the world if you'll just sort out this situation. Of course, that's not true. That's not why people become missionaries or anything else a lot of the time. But this is where we parked last week. So now look at the fourth thing about storms. Storms come with a choice. There's always a choice in a storm. And Jesus said to them, Why are you afraid, O you of little faith? That's a strange question to ask in a storm that sounds like a freight train. Why are you scared? That's like asking somebody in a sailboat that's caught in a hurricane, why are you scared? Isn't it obvious why they're scared? The mother of all storms is bearing down on us. The boat is full of water and we're about to drown. Obviously we're scared. So why does Jesus why say, why are you afraid? Well, it's the statement after the question that qualifies and clarifies the question. Why are you afraid, O oh, you of little faith? That's why he asks them why they're scared. They don't trust him. They have no faith. Or they got a little bit of faith, just a dribble. Luke 8.25 says, he asked them, where is your faith? Whatever faith they have, it's not directed at him. It's scattered, it's untargeted. They just don't trust him. There's always a choice in a storm. You can trust and have peace, or you can doubt and be scared. Robin had no idea what I was going to be talking about this morning. I thought that was a magnificent prayer. You just prayed this morning, by the way. You talked about the relationship between trust and peace. Did I teach you that? <laughs> that was wonderful. Uh, wonderful collaboration. Yeah, that's right, that's right. Same Holy Spirit. Um, fear and doubt go hand in hand. Trust and peace go hand in hand. A few years ago, I took the most terrifying donkey ride of my life. Last donkey ride I was on before this was when I was 10 years old on the beach at Port Rush in Ireland. And there was a world of difference between that donkey ride and this one. This donkey ride, five, six years ago, was a white knuckle ride down some ridiculously steep steps that were about 500 years old, and they zigzagged back and forth with 180 degree hairpin turns for about a thousand feet down the side of a cliff, and they would never pass inspection here in Toronto. It was on a Greek island called 
Santorini. The donkeys had no saddle. You sat on its back while it was tilted forward at a 45 degree angle and you held on with a rope while it was a moving target rocking and rolling and their hoofs are slipping and sliding on the steps uh, and you're about to slide over the donkey's head at any moment and tumble a thousand feet down this cliff. Every turn the donkey would use the three foot high outside wall as a kind of a guide wall like a streetcar track and it scuffed around the wall with my leg between it and the wall <laughs> and it was kind of like turning by braille and there's a thousand foot drop on the other side of this three foot high wall and I'm six foot up on top of this donkey and it's a nightmare ride and my heart is in my mouth and I'm wondering why did I pay good money for this when I could have walked down. By the time I got halfway down, I wanted to carry the donkey down and see, see how he felt about it. But my two girls and their cousin, Belinda and my sister had the sense to take the tram car up and down the mountain. But they're having a ball. I'm looking over at them, and they're killing themselves laughing. And I realize they're laughing at me. And they're kicking the donkey under the belly with their heels to make it go faster. Well, I want to get off and carry the donkey. What made the difference? between me and them. They trusted, and I didn't. Trust always leads to peace, and joy, and fun, and laughter. It's that simple. Doubt, lack of faith, lack of trust, always leads to fear and panic and dread. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 is, in my estimation, one of the most important sets of verses in the Bible. Would make a terrific life verse. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge Him and he will make your path straight and you'll have peace and joy and pleasure that's the choice in a storm why are you afraid oh you of little faith you can choose doubt and fear or you can choose trust and peace. By the way, fear is like an underground river. It, it runs very deep, fear does. Fear was the very first negative emotion recorded in the Bible. Adam in the Garden of Eden hid because he admitted, I was afraid. First negative emotion. God said, fear not, over 300 times, all the way through the Bible. Fear may well be the driving emotion of all other negative emotions. Some people are angry because they're scared. Some people are depressed because they're scared. Some people give up on their dreams because they're scared. Some people struggle with anxiety and worry and guilt and shame, sadness, because of fear. So when, pe when Jesus says, why are you afraid? Well, the answer in that context was obvious. 
But that's a good question to ask ourselves. Next time you're angry or anxious or sad or feel guilty, ask yourself that penetrating question. Why am I afraid? So there's the choice. Doubt and fear or trust and peace. Now, we're not talking about a blind trust here. We're not talking about some Pollyanna experience, looking at life through rose-colored glasses, only ever seeing the positive and the optimistic. We're not talking about some naive trust. It, it's not like a shady salesman with suspect motives saying to you, just trust me with all of your money. This trust is established by sound, rock-solid proof. You need proof that God can be trusted, don't you? I mean, if you're going to trust somebody in the storm, you need proof that he does indeed have command over the storm, don't you? That leads us to the next observation. Storms are subject to God's power. Look at the next verse. Then he rose, Jesus did, and rebuked the wind and the sea. And there was a great calm. Notice verse 24. There was a great storm. And now verse 26. There was a great calm. Dramatic extremes. Can we all agree on something? If Jesus is able to command an extreme weather condition, like a great storm, and then instantaneously turn it into a great calm with just the sound of his voice, then he must be God. I mean, who else can do that? Who else could he possibly be? And if you're wondering if this event actually happened, maybe it's a myth, somebody told you that these stories in the Bible are mythic, they're legend, they didn't really happen. Well, you've got to ask yourself the question, why would four men, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, claim that it happened if it didn't happen? Two of them were eyewitnesses. They were actually on the boat, and the other two got it from an eyewitness, and probably nine other eyewitnesses were in the boat when it happened, and all of them eventually died because of what they said about Jesus. That begs the question, why would they all say it happened if it didn't? So if Jesus exercises absolute power over the weather, then there is no storm in your life, in your marriage, in your family, in your kids' lives, in your health, in your money, in your job, in your emotions, that he cannot handle. By the way, that does not mean that God will promise to make all of your problems go away. God does not always calm the storm before the boat sinks. The Titanic sank, and there were Christ followers on board that boat. The ship that Horatio Spafford's family was on, it sank and his family drowned. And yet Horatio Spafford wrote one of the most memorable hymns of the history of the church. When peace like a river attends my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul, even when the storm doesn't calm down. God doesn't promise a storybook ending this side of heaven. When God supernaturally calms a storm the way he did here, it is for his glory, not for our comfort. That is the purpose of all of Jesus' miracles. 
to give honor and glory and praise to Jesus, and secondly, so that people would believe in him. 1 John chapter 2 makes that very clear at the end of his first miracle when he turned water into wine. Verse 11 says, This was the first of his signs, and Jesus did it at Cana in Galilee, and he manifested his glory. That's why Jesus did miracles, to bring glory and honor to him. And secondly, so that people would believe. And John adds that in verse 11 of John chapter 2. His disciples believed in him. It's the purpose of miracles. But God doesn't always calm the storm in order to display his glory. Sometimes he lets us display his glory in the storm by the way we respond to the storm. Joni Erickson Tata was 16 years old when she dived off a rock at the family cottage and snapped her neck on a rock just onto the surface and broke her back and instantly became a quadriplegic. I remember one scene in the movie of her life. She was sitting in her wheelchair and a journalist, I think it was, asked her, do you ever get bitter, bitter and angry at God? And she said, I would rather be in this wheelchair in the will of God than out of this wheelchair out of the will of God. And God was glorified in her storm because of her attitude. In every storm, we have a choice. We either trust or doubt. We either become bitter or better. If we become better, then we put God's power and God's glory on display. If we become bitter in a storm, we're on our own. Greatest opportunity for God to display His glory in your life is against the backdrop of a storm. Not necessarily by calming that storm, but by giving you strength and grace to be able to trust Him and hope in His presence and His power in the middle of it. He calmed this storm so that you will trust Him when He doesn't calm your storm. Now, one more observation. Look at the value of a storm. It's hard to see the value in a storm when storms can cause so much devastation and destruction. But look what happens. The man marveled, saying, what sort of man is this that even wind and sea obey him? See, the value of a storm is that it can change what you believe about Jesus. And sometimes change means admitting that you know less rather than more. Let me show you what I mean. They don't know who they've got in this boat as a result of this storm. Look what it says. What sort of man is this? The storm has changed them. They now know less than what they thought they knew. They thought they knew who Jesus was before the storm. There was lots of opinions about who Jesus was before the storm. Some people were convinced that he was Elijah come back from the dead. Some people thought he was Jeremiah come back from the dead. Some people were convinced that he was some other prophet. Some people thought he was just a good man. Some people thought he was a great teacher. Some people thought that he was demon-possessed. Some people thought he was just a man, the son of Mary and Joseph. There was lots of opinions about Jesus, and they were, they were solid in their belief that their opinion was right. That's the nature of opinions. We all have opinions, and we're all convinced that our opinion is right. Well, there's still lots of opinions about Jesus today. 
Jesus is one of the most recognizable historical figures in the world. I read somewhere that the face of Jesus has been on the cover of Maclean's magazine more than any other historical figure in history. Ask anybody for their opinion on Jesus and everybody has an opinion about who Jesus was. Some people think Jesus was the Florence Nightingale or the Mother Teresa of the ancient world, a, a great healer. Some people think he was a revolutionary. Some people think he was a political leader. Muslims believe that he did not die on a cross, that Judas died in his place. Not everybody can be right when everybody has a different opinion. You cannot arrive at the right answer to who Jesus is when you have strong, wrong opinions about who Jesus is. But this storm has brought them to this place where they confess that they don't know who he is. They don't have a category for him. Look what it says. They marveled. They're amazed. He's got their attention. They have never come across anybody like this ever before. That's the first step in becoming a follower of Christ. If you are in a storm right now, God brought you here today to let you know that the value of your storm is to show you that you must park all your preconceived notions and opinions about who you think Jesus is and simply marvel and confess that you really don't know who he is. You have to be willing to say as a first step, who is this? Until a person admits that they do not know who Jesus is. They can never discover who he really is. What sort of man is this? In other words, they had to unlearn before they could learn. The storm has become an education in reverse. Sometimes before you can be educated, you need to be uneducated. Before you can know, you have to admit what you don't know. George Bush's Secretary of Defense, uh, Donald Rumsfeld, many years ago tried to impress everybody with what he knew. Well, he probably wasn't trying to impress people, but he made a statement about what we know and what we don't know. And he, he said this, quote, Reports that say that something hasn't happened are always interesting to me because, as we know, there are known knowns. That is, there are things we know we know. That seems rather obvious. Then he says, we also know there are known unknowns. That is to say, there are some things we know we do not know. And then he says this, but there are also unknown unknowns. Those are the things we don't know, we don't know. And if you were able to follow that, you're a better man than me, because I don't understand any of that. <laughs> These guys do not have a category for Jesus. He was an unknown quantity. He's an unknown unknown. What kind of man can do this? Who is able to harness the wind? Who can rebuke the waves and have the waves heed the command? Who can do that? It's the first step in becoming a Christian, to confess that you don't know who Jesus is. But you can't stay there. There's another storm story in Matthew's Gospel, six chapters later, in chapter 14. This one happens chapter 8, the next one's chapter 14. That's the one where Jesus actually walks on water and he gets into the boat and he does the exact same thing to the storm as he did here. He controls the weather and he calms the storm with simply the sound of his voice. But there's a different response from the disciples the second time. In Matthew 14, verse 33, it says this, And those who were in the boat worshipped him. 
saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. They're not saying, Who is this anymore? Now they're saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. In six chapters, they've grown, they've learned, they've discovered. They've gotten themselves educated as to the identity of the Lord Jesus Christ. They've gotten saved because they admitted that they didn't know who he was. Now they're able to confess who he really is. Truly, you are the Son of God. We're standing in the very presence of God. This is God in a physical body. And He's worthy of our worship. And they drop to their knees and they worship Him right there in the boat. The God who is worthy of our love and devotion and obedience is right here in the boat with us. Jesus is the one that John describes in the book of Revelation. The last book of the Bible in that amazing scene in heaven and here's how he describes Jesus there then I looked and I heard around the throne and the living creatures and the elders the voices of many angels numbering myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands saying with a loud voice worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing and I heard every creature in heaven and on, on earth and onto the earth and in the sea and all that is in them saying to him who sits on the throne to the lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever and the four living creatures said amen and the elders fell down and they worshiped Wow, what a scene. This is the Christ who was worthy of our worship. This is the one that we trust when we're going through our storms. This is the one who's in your boat. The value of a storm is that you can discover the true identity of Christ in the middle of a storm. And that can change your life forever. If you're in a storm today, before you panic, before you run for the exits, reach out to Him. Trust Him. He may not calm the storm, but He promises He will help you. And He'll give you the strength to get through it. And you will have power, serious power, in your corner. Let's pray. Father, thank You for this great display of Your power over storms. <clears throat> for your love, for your care for our lives. I pray that if somebody here today is going through a storm, Father, give them the strength to choose trust over doubt. Let them find peace over fear. Lord, if somebody here today does not know Christ, please bring them to the place where they will surrender all of their preconceived notions about who Jesus is and that they will marvel and ask, who is this man? And that you will enable them to say truly, you are the Son of God. You are worthy of my worship. And I want to follow you in obedience for the rest of my life. In Christ's strong name we pray. Amen.